The stunning view from above tonight revealing the path of destruction. At least three people are dead. After fast moving storms plowed through the Midwest. Dangerous twisters. It's okay. It's okay. Tearing across Illinois. That's freaking crazy. In the small town of Nayplate, howling winds splintered this neighborhood. It was like the finger of God. It was just wiping the slate clean. It's just, this isn't a devastation anybody should go through. A home ripped off the foundation. But the In Missouri, a tornado near Perryville ripped apart homes for 13 miles. You can see those cars tossed about. And flung cars off the interstate. The powerful line of storms raced east today. Winds gusting to 60 miles an hour. 104 million people in its path. Hail pounding parts of Alabama. The relentless wind and rain toppling trees in Tennessee. This little boy surviving after one split his living room in half. And we heard a bang, and that's when the tree came in and hit, hit us. The storms tipping this trailer in Kentucky. Today, communities are flooded around Columbus, Ohio, after fierce storms there. Back in Illinois, Melissa DeTore says she rode out the tornado in her bathtub. I just hunched over my dog and just prayed that we didn't die that day and we didn't. She's thankful their lives were spared when so much else wasn't. This is the only way millions in Santiago are able to get clean water. A long wait at emergency tanks to fill up bottles and buckets. And this is why. The rivers that millions depend on now raging with rubble and mud. The heavy rain which started on Saturday rushed down the Andes mountains, triggering enormous mudslides some of which then slammed into people's homes. The owner of this house faces an enormous cleanup without fresh water. The living room completely covered in a carpet of sludge. At least four people are known to have died and the force of the rushing water has destroyed bridges and closed roads, leaving some people trapped in their villages. We have a flood that cut through several places. We are cleaning it with machines but it completely took out a bridge and has left more than 1,000 people isolated. The lack of clean water has also closed schools, businesses and restaurants. Authorities say until the rivers clear up, the taps have to stay off to avoid contamination. It's a wait that could go on for several days. Rescue workers have been forced to evacuate scores of people from a San Jose neighborhood in California after floodwaters from an overflowing creek inundated a residential area. Around 200 were taken from their homes, while more had to be rescued from their cars as water levels began to rise along the Coyote Creek in a neighborhood of Silicon Valley. Last weekend, California lived through its biggest storm in years, which unleashed a wave of rain and snow that killed at least three people. Most U.S. wildfires aren't wild. A new study shows humans sparked 84% of blazes over two decades and almost doubled the acreage burned. Researchers studied 20 years of fires that were severe enough for state or federal agencies to fight. It's the most thorough picture yet of the role humans play in wildfires. The steep numbers are because people spread fire where and when natural causes usually don't. Most fires started by lightning happen in the western half of the country and burn during the summer. Humans live everywhere in the U.S. all year round. And this is the latest research to show how climate change compounds the problem. When the environment dries out and warms up, fires, especially from human activity, get more likely. The start to fire season is creeping into spring. As it gets hotter earlier, the risk of fire increases. Researchers say this new attention on the human element of wildfires could help us prevent some of them and even make them useful. Forestry experts say setting smaller managed fires can keep larger wild ones from getting out of control. An earthquake of magnitude 5.6 has struck near the Japanese city of Fukushima in the northeast of the country. The nearby nuclear plant is not said to have been affected. The quake's epicenter was some 50 kilometers below the surface. I wasn't at home, so I was quite surprised, but a store clerk guided us, so there wasn't any panicking. 
Fukushima was one of the most badly affected areas in the March the 11th, 2011 earthquake, which caused the worst catastrophe in a nearby nuclear power plant since the Chernobyl accident in Ukraine in 1986. The tremor nearly six years ago was followed by a devastating tsunami wave, which left thousands dead or missing. Drought often causes water shortages in the town of Kadal. The dry land in the Sahel region on the southern edge of the Sahara Desert is one of the harshest places to live on Earth. Unrest is compounding Kadal's many problems. People here have suffered from successive droughts. The fighting has caused chaos. Many have been forced to leave and search for water, but to get to water they have to use pumps. Pumps operate for just a few hours a day because of a lack of fuel. They don't supply enough water to meet demand. We have a few wells, but the underground water runs deep, and we don't have pumps that can get it out. So we divide water from the wells between nine neighborhoods. Each gets a share of water every 10 days. So that is their market. Bulama Muhammad Chetima says the jihadist Boko Haram group has devastated Nigeria's northeast, especially in his village of Bene Sheikh. Boko Haram killed people, more than 3,000 people, more than 1,000 houses born. But Boko Haram's influence runs deeper than that. Their seven year insurgency has prevented the planting of crops, and the United Nations says close to 3 million people are facing famine. Half a million children under five are suffering from severe acute malnutrition. Yagana Modu says she's getting desperate. My children and I, we need food. The biggest problem we have is hunger. The government says it has nearly defeated Boko Haram, but it still faces suicide bombings and attacks, which have left the country struggling to rebuild. An international donors conference has pledged nearly $700 million over the next three years, but many Nigerians say they can't wait that long. Thousands of families caught up in South Sudan's famine are hiding from marauding gunmen in the swamps and islands of the River Nile. With next to no food, many have been surviving for months on wild plants and the occasional fish. Most are women and children. They recently emerged from the marshland after word spread that help had arrived. We don't have enough food. We are in the war and we have many, many problems we have in our home. Now we need enough food that we solve our problem. Uh, they've been living on water lilies, they've been living on roots from reeds in the, in, 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 in the rivers. They, 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 at most they eat once a day. It's really tough condition. Last week, the United Nations declared famine in parts of South Sudan, the world's youngest nation. The UN claims the crisis is largely man-made. The country was thrown into turmoil when a civil war erupted in 2013. The conflict has displaced millions, with many fleeing to other countries, notably neighboring Sudan and northern Uganda. Gathering a meal for the day, Kanze and her brothers are picking wild berries and cactus to feed their family. Drought in Bamba village has caused their maize harvest to fail for the fourth season running. The drought has been going on for so long. We have nothing to harvest. We have lost our livelihood and my children are hungry, so we have to look for food in the bush. Poor rainfall means this family and 10,000 others here have nothing to live on. More than 60% of the people in the Ganze area rely on farming, but their crops have been decimated by the ongoing drought. The drought is affecting at least 65,000 people in this community. The government is sending $60 a month to families to buy food and water or feed their livestock. But these cash transfers could end next week, leaving families with few places to turn because the drought is expected to worsen. Aid agencies say they must get food to an estimated 3 million people to avert a famine in Africa's Lake Chad region. Launching a funding appeal, the UN says drought, chronic poverty and Boko Haram militants have led to the situation. International donors at a conference in Oslo have pledged 672 million US dollars. For decades, 
people in this region have struggled with poverty and the harsh effects of climate change, and too often alone. Boko Haram's terror caused a displacement crisis. Now it has become a severe food and nutrition crisis. The United Nations has launched a $1 billion appeal for Nigeria and the Lake Chad region in the grip of what's described as the worst humanitarian crisis in Africa. The most urgent needs to reach 2.8 million people with rice, sorghum or money by this coming July. It turns out elephants aren't safe from poachers, even when they are living on protected land. In 2004, an estimated 35,000 forest elephants lived in Gabon's Minkebi National Park in Africa. But new research from Duke University says around 80% of those elephants had been killed by poachers by 2014. Forest elephants' tusks are made of an extra hard ivory that's pinkish in color, making them a prime target for poachers. This latest finding seems to build on a 2013 estimate that as many as 100 of these elephants were being killed every day. Gabon's government has attempted to stop the poaching of its elephants by creating a national park police force and increasing the prison terms for ivory poachers. The Duke researchers say Gabon needs to work more with law enforcement across its borders. Poachers from its neighbor to the north, Cameroon, play a large part in the illegal ivory trade. Experts estimate there are now roughly 75,000 forest elephants living in Central Africa. Africa. France is to cull a further 360,000 ducks as part of efforts to prevent the spread of the H5N8 bird flu virus. The slaughter will take place in Londres, the Pyrenees and Atlantic regions in the southwest of the country. The area is home to most of France's foie gras producers. France and Hungary have been the country's hardest hit by the highly contagious H5N8 virus that's been spreading across Europe, the Middle East and African countries in the past three months. Texas is apparently at war with wild hogs, and the state might have found a way to conquer them. Let's backtrack a little. In 2011, Texas Agriculture Commissioner Sid Miller made it legal for hunters to shoot feral hogs from helicopters to curb the invasive species population numbers. Apparently, that wasn't enough. Now he wants to use a controversial anticoagulant called warfarin to deal with the more than 2 million wild pigs that plague the state. Warfarin is used in rodent poison. It causes bleeding both internally and externally and turns the insides of the animal that ingests it blue. It can also be painful. But Miller claims the invasive species preys on newborn animals, poses a danger to humans on highways, and causes millions of dollars in damage to agriculture every year. The animals are becoming a problem in more and more places. A study found invasive hog populations are making their way across the United States. Hunters and wildlife activists are already criticizing the measure in Texas. Thousands of people have signed a petition to stop warfarin from being used. They argue the pesticide could contaminate humans. Mount Etna has surged into life in Sicily, spewing giant orange fountains of lava into the air. Despite being visible from as far away as Catania and Taormina, experts say this latest eruption is not dangerous. The airport at Catania is still open and operating. Palestinians and foreign activists have gathered to mark the 23rd anniversary of the closure of Shahada Street in the West Bank city of Hebron. They used the occasion to protest against US President Donald Trump, claiming he did not see them as equals and throwing shoes at his portrait. The street was closed after a Jewish extremist killed 29 Palestinians while they were praying in the Al-Ibrahimi Mosque in 1994. Protests against Philippines President Rodrigo Duterte's rule have erupted in Manila, a day after the arrest of one of the leader's biggest critics. On the anniversary of the fall of Ferdinand Marcos's corrupt and brutal regime, demonstrators marched through the island nation's capital, drawing a parallel with Duterte's war on drugs, which has claimed close to 8,000 lives in seven months. One parallelism that we see from Duterte and Marcos is the silencing of dissent. Whenever you oppose them, you will be labeled as yellows. You, whenever you oppose them, you will be labeled as a narco, um, supporter of narco-politics and, drug, and drugs. We don't support those things. Senator and former Justice Secretary Leila de Lima is an outspoken opponent of Duterte's war on drugs. She was arrested on Friday for allegedly violating drug trafficking law by taking bribes from dealers operating inside prisons. 
Rights groups have said de Lima's arrest was a politically motivated attempt to silence an opponent. Duterte's reign has attracted controversy for its brutal approach to policing drugs, with thousands of killings carried out by both officers and vigilantes. Almost half of the UK's entire recent weapons exports have gone to Saudi Arabia. That's according to the latest report from the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute. But the study shows that only Britain sends such a large proportion of its weapons to Riyadh. In 2012 to last year, the Saudis paid at least £5.6 billion for UK military equipment. But the bilateral special relationship has been widely criticized. Riyadh launched a military intervention in Yemen in 2015, and it has repeatedly been accused of committing war crimes following reports of the bombing of schools and hospitals. A deadly attack in the Syrian city of Homs is being slammed as a deliberate attempt to wreck peace talks in Geneva. United Nations peace envoy Staffan de Mistura said the warring side should not allow such spoilers to succeed. Suicide bombers stormed two security offices in Homs, killing dozens with gunfire and explosions, including the head of military security. This is the opposing sides in Geneva traded blame and appeared no closer to actual negotiations. Today, the national test is that we expect these platforms, the opposition platforms, to condemn this terrorist act, he says. What happened has cast a shadow over Geneva. Therefore, the terrorist attack that took place in Homs was not only a military terrorist attack, it was also a political terrorist attack. Syria's top opposition delegates in Geneva said they do condemn terrorism, but hinted that the government may have been behind the Homs attacks. The regime is trying to sabotage the talks, he says. We promise our people, we promise you that we will continue in this political process, trying to achieve our goals. The jihadist rebel alliance Tahir al-Sham, which opposes the Geneva talks, celebrated the Homs strike, but stopped short of explicitly claiming responsibility. 
in where you may have... Donald Trump has accused his predecessor of playing a part in the organization of nationwide demonstrations since his election win. The U.S. president also blamed Barack Obama for the leaks of classified information from the White House to the press. It down differently from what I mean. Well, you never know what's exactly happening behind the scenes. You know, you're probably right or possibly right, but you never know. No, I think that President Obama is behind it because his people are certainly behind it. And some of the leaks possibly come from that group, you know, some of the leaks, which are really very serious leaks because they're very bad in terms of national security. But I also understand that's politics. And in terms of him being behind things, that's politics. And it will probably continue. He didn't provide any evidence to support the claims made during an interview with Fox News. Trump also expressed rare self-criticism, awarding himself an A grade for achievement, but a mere C for communicating his message. An Obama-era rule on gun background checks was officially overturned on Tuesday. As expected, President Donald Trump signed a bill that had already passed both houses of Congress. At the end of his term, former President Barack Obama mandated the Social Security Administration hand the FBI info on any person with a documented mental health issue who can't manage their disability benefits without a representative. The Obama administration predicted the rule would affect roughly 75,000 people. Supporters argued it kept some with serious mental health issues from buying guns. But opponents argued the rule was too broad and overestimated the risk to the public. To be clear, studies have found having a mental illness doesn't increase a person's chances of using a gun violently and only slightly increases the risk of a gun-related suicide. A federal court upheld Maryland's ban on dozens of different assault weapons. The Fourth U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals ruled 10 to 4, quote, We have no power to extend Second Amendment protection to the weapons of war. Judge Robert King said the only reason to have high-powered weapons such as AR-15s was to, quote, lay waste to a battlefield full of combatants. Maryland's law bans 45 different kinds of firearms and limits magazines to 10 rounds. The measure was passed in 2013 in response to the Sandy Hook Elementary School shooting. A National Rifle Association spokesperson said, quote, It is absurd to hold that the most popular rifle in America is not a protected arm under the Second Amendment. 